Okay, next up is Seth Gallagher. He is the uh, HBS Initiative Capacity Coordinator or something like that. <laughs> so anyway, Wes is from, or Seth is from the uh, Intermountain West Joint Venture and Peasants Forever. And, uh, and uh, anyway, he's going to give us an update on SGI, HBS Initiative. Well, I realize I think I'm the bump now between you guys and lunch, so I'll try to uh, make this brief, but that's pretty hard for me. Great. Okay. I was going to actually use coming off of Monarch into Tanichi to get to sunset last night, how lucky we are in this whole thing. But it's been used twice already, so I'm going to scrap that and just jump right into it for the sake of time. Um, first, so I want to set up uh, the context of this talk with a couple points before I get buried into the PowerPoint here. Um, the first is I'm in the federal perspectives um, section, and just uh, some fine print here that uh, I'm not a federal employee. I do. I am employed by Pheasants Forever. Um, the Sage Grass Initiative, as you see here. Is a, is a larger collaborative effort. That while the mine share is funded through USDA and NRCS funds, um, there's a lot of NGOs, state agencies, other federal agencies that, that make this whole thing come together and work. Um, the second is, I would be remiss if I didn't frame this as a voluntary program um, that takes place primarily on private lands. And so we get caught up in talking about acres, pushing dirt, exchanging dollars, but at the end of the day, if there weren't private landowners willing to participate, this whole effort would be moot. And so um, I want to make sure um, that everyone is thinking of that in the context of the larger talk here. Um, additionally, you know, I'm going to show a lot of our results, a lot of what's been accomplished through SGI. And I don't really, I'd ask if you don't mistake that for sort of bragging about how awesome SGI is. I, I really, um, hope people think of it in the context of uh, how unprecedented the effort is in regard to the resources that are available and the scale at which some of these things are happening. And so um, that's really kind of the key message. And then how do we collectively as a conservation community work to make sure that those resources um, you know, are being used on the best things in the best places. And so think, also think of the talk um, in that context. So um, what is the Sage Grouse Initiative? Um, you know, it is a, a fairly new model. It's under the NRCS's Working Lands for Wildlife program. Um, it, pro it provides uh, financial incentive as well as technical assistance, and that's another important point as we, again, we talk about dollars, we talk about acres. But at the heart of what NRCS does and at the heart of what SGI does is provide technical assistance. And you'll talk to some of our field folks, and some of their most rewarding projects are those places where they go and they provide a conservation plan and there may not be a dollar exchange. Okay? It's just someone wants to know how they can do something better that benefits their operation and the wildlife that, that exists there. So there's, there's a lot of that that goes on that we don't talk about, that doesn't get tracked. And I think it's important, again, to put that in, your back, in the back of your mind as something that SGI does achieve. Um, of course, there is financial. You're going to see financial. You're going to see numbers. and, and, and uh, Whole bunch of stuff here coming up. And then, um, as Drew mentioned, there is um, certainty that's provided along with, and that's what makes the Working Lands for Wildlife program pretty unique, is that there is a set number of practices that have been um, identified in a conference report with the Fish and Wildlife Service, 30 some practices essentially that if a landowner implements, um, the service has agreed that those practices are covered under a conference report and they won't come back and regulate you within the course of 30 years on those specific practices. So it's a little different than a CCAA. It's very practice specific. It's very according to the conservation plan. If a landowner deviates from all of that and does something completely different, this isn't like a get out of jail free card. It's, it's just specific to those practices. So that's something to be clear about too. So today's talk, uh, I've got a ton to cover. Um, each one of these slides is a rabbit hole I could spend an hour on. I'm gonna try to give you sort of the high cut of this and what is SGI, what we've accomplished to date, where are we going in the future, and then how can we make this locally effective? <laughs> what, in, in what context does this impact Colorado? Um, so with that, we'll jump right in here. 
So uh, there's a, a couple legs to the table of SGI that really hold up SGI that's different than a, than a lot of other efforts on the landscape. And so I'm going to go through those here real quick. The first one is science. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide other than to say, um, you know, we have a science advisor, Dave Novel, out of the University of Montana. He has a number of postdocs and research associates underneath him working on things. A lot of focus on uh, spatially targeting tools. So uh, what are the practices we should be implementing and where should we be doing them? Kind of range-wide um, type, type big modeling efforts. And as I go through the talk, there'll be a couple opportunities for me to kind of interject a little bit of the science that's been done um, and completed. And again, this is um, it's pretty exciting stuff. I mean, there's been a, a pretty significant investment in, in these dollars and, and, and resources that are available for science. And so really trying to make, the, make sure that SGI is, is a science-driven endeavor. One of the things that really attracted me to SGI is that in conservation, um, we're very good about doing things and we're horrible about talking about them. And so SGI sort of recognizes the need to communicate, not only to practitioners on the ground, but to the general public. Um, and so everything from, you know, I haven't put them out yet, but I'm, I've got a box full of stuff that you can help yourself to. Um, and it's everything from translating the best available science to practitioners to popular you know, articles in popular uh, magazines and other conservation organizations um, to social media, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. So um, the, the idea there is to increase landowner participation um, in SGI, but then also to build long-term support um, with many different audiences um, regarding our efforts. So the other leg, and this is the leg that I wake up thinking about every day, this is kind of um, my role with SGI, is to coordinate the, the field capacity end of things. And so we have 26 partner biologist positions across 10 states. Um, and there's something like eight different hiring entities and 40 different funding partners. So when people ask me what I do, I tell them that, and that's a lot. I mean, there's just a lot of moving parts to this at, at all times. And so making sure everybody's happy with accomplishments and coordination and, and that their investment is being met. Um, and so you can see um, we're, we're pretty well distributed across the, the range currently. Um, Marcel Fremgen is here in Montrose and has some SGI funding, um, but also support from Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, BLM, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I'm looking at Gillian to make sure I got everybody. And Colorado owners, yeah. And Colorado owners, yes. And so that position um, sits in the Montrose NRCS office and, and can assist with um, technical assistance, and it's hosted by the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, and so we, uh, I think there's a lot of strength in this model. There's strengths and weaknesses. I'd be glad to visit with folks about some of that. But I think when, when you embed someone in a community um, and they give it the time to work, I think you really see results. A lot of folks may remember Christina Santana was in a similar position um, actually prior to SGI even existing. And, and the idea here is to address capacity roadblocks at a local level. And I think one of the strengths of our team is um, providing them the technical know-how. We, we get them together once a year. There's a really kind of a tight network of folks across the West who are working on these issues. And, um, and I think it's a, it's a good deal altogether. We also, we have on occasion, um, again, we have the flexibility to address those bottlenecks at the local level. So we have done some, some things like contract archaeologists to do cultural uh, clearance surveys to get projects in California. So we have the flexibility to do some things sometimes that, that need, need to happen in order for projects to occur. Um, as I mentioned, lots of moving parts, lots of partners on this. Um, the majority of the funding does come from NRCS. Um, our second largest federal partner is the Fish and Wildlife Service Region 6 Partners Program. Um, they do give us a significant amount of funding. We've got uh, all these folks up there uh, that are providing administrative support, often financial support, um, to the positions that are out there on the ground. So what do those positions do? Well, there's really sort of four things that we kind of divide up into. And these are the accomplishments from 2010 to 2014, so the first four years of the program, what's, what's been accomplished. Uh, prescribed grazing um, systems, reseeding, uh, range seedings, reseeding areas of cropland, 
um, and then also weed management, and that's been done. Most of that 2.4 million acres is prescribed grazing systems. Conservation easements, um, 450,000 acres. Uh, removed conifers uh, across the landscape, 400,000 acres of that, and then um, fence marking. Uh, 350 miles and, and the fence marking stuff is, is targeted so there is a targeting tool out there that looks at topography looks at proximity to lek so it's not just about going out and putting vinyl across the landscape and making people feel good about it it is a targeted effort um, that's out there on the ground again science driven so when you roll that all up in, in the five-year um, deal uh, it's uh, 6,800 square miles have received some sort of assistance uh, from the Sagegrass Initiative, over 1,100 ranches participating, and a lot of money. So I like to show maps. I think it shows the scale at which we're, we're operating, and so I don't know how well that's showing up, but um, basically the green is um, grouse uh, range, and the dark green I think is priority areas. The warmer colors are conservation easements, the lighter colors are restoration activities. But it gives you a sense across the 11 state range for sage grouse, kind of where SGI activities are occurring, and the fact that they're, they're pretty highly targeted to areas where we, where we know they're gonna have some impact on grouse um, population. And so, um, the, again, this is just a broad overview of, of all the types of practices that we uh, implement. So conservation easements, not only um, since the impetus or the, the, the beginning of SGI, not only has it increased the, the quantity um, of conservation easements across the West, but also the size, the quality. We've seen um, conservation easements four and a half times larger um, with SGI resources available now uh, than, than they were in the past. And again, 450,000 acres across the West, um, 70 or 94% of those are perpetual conservation easement. So um, the orange or yellowish, I guess I'm color blind, the yellow are sort of uh, pre-SGI easements and then that sort of darker red color is easements that have occurred um, since SGI has been funded in 2010. If you really boil down, boil this down to a local landscape, this is the Pioneer Mountains um, in uh, Idaho and so this is Sun Valley Ketchum so fairly high demand for sort of uh, ex-urban subdivision, 40, 40 acre ranchette type deals. This is Craters of the Moon um, National Monument. And the white is the private matrix, the tan is BLM, the green is conservation easements, uh, this is Forest Service Green, this is the monument in pink. And um, you know, thanks to partners, mostly the Nature Conservancy in Idaho um, and SGI funding, it moves to landscape that looks like this and so those are um, the various conservation easements that have been implemented again at a local level in various stages of uh, either being funded or in progress so pretty impactful stuff um, at the local level rangeland health um, the story to me here really is that each of these polygons you see a cluster of projects that happen and each of these is really um, a face and a story and a person that's been embedded in that community help move the needle for sage grouse conservation. And so this is really where I think our SWAT model or strategic watershed action team, so our biologists out on the ground, um, this is re really where I, I see them making an impact. Um, and so uh, just kind of, you know, you see these clusters of activity and, and you, you, you um, gives you some assurance that, that uh, things are getting done. Conifer removal. Um, Oregon's kind of been the poster child for conifer removal. Range-wide, there's been 405,000 acres done through 2014. Again, you can see the dark green clusters um, are the activities of conifer removal. Uh, the focus really is on what's called phase one and phase two conifer removal. So this is areas where it's encroaching. It's not, it's not an established or a persistent um, conifer forest. It's areas that were sage um, uplands that are, that are now changing based on you know, fire and grazing regimes. Um, and to go back into some of the SGI science, here's some work coming out of Oregon. Basically, it shows that when you reach 4% conifer cover, you see this hockey stick, the probability of your leg being active at 4% conifer cover 
um, is greatly reduced. And so I don't think that's any secret to folks here. Um, as BLM mentioned, you know, conifer removal efforts have been occurring down here for, for quite a while. But again, pre and post SGI in Oregon, um, you can see not a lot of resources being put to the issue. And then during SGI, you see this ramping up of resources that are available, 199,000 acres alone um, in Oregon. And the ability to, um, you know, through remote sensing, to really spatially target what are the important areas that, to do this in. Um, and then you can look at your priority, uh, your packs, and you can look at you know, how many acres are encroached, and then, um, you know, kind of total it all up to try to figure out, you know, when are you close to done? What's what's the what's your goal as opposed to just going out and continually doing this, having some measure of success? Two minutes, holy cow. Okay, uh, so this is really cool. This is where uh, it all kind of comes together. This is a website that came out a week and a half ago, maps.sagegrouseinitiative.com, and it actually gives you some of the spatial targeting tools. It's available to everybody. This one has tree, tree canopy cover. This map is a um, resiliency, um, resistance and resiliency to disturbance, so the red areas are more likely to convert to cheatgrass post-fire than the, the cooler areas on the map. And so you can go in on this website and uh, you can download the layers or you can utilize the Google interface. So just, uh, a, we're moving into what we're calling SGI 2.0. So uh, the initiative is funded through 2018 at this point in time. And so you can see there's a large commitment of resources from NRCS through the end of the next farm bill. Uh, they've moved to this investment strategy. So they have this range-wide investment strategy and then it's stepped down by state. And so the idea here now is we've got these milestones, not only range-wide, but by state. So for each of those restoration practices or easements, we've kind of got a measure of where are we going with this, how much have we accomplished, and what do we want to get done by 2018. And so um, I'm going to run out of time here, but one of the things that was identified in 2.0 is music wet meadow restoration, which is SGI has not spent a lot of time on. Um, right here in Gunnison, um, you guys are absolutely taking the lead on this. I get to see range-wide efforts, and, and nothing's even come close to what's occurring in Gunnison. And so if we can take what you all are doing and replicate it range-wide, I think we'll really be on to something. So Nate's going to give a talk to our field folks in May, a webinar about the efforts here. and hoping that that's kind of contagious. So I don't have time really to go into this, but there's a lot of money available for Colorado, four and a half million between now and 2018. Um, Here's kind of the breakdown of conservation easements. So where are we trying to get to um, within the packs, without, outside the packs, broken down by Gunnison sage-grouse and greater sage-grouse, what's been accomplished to date, and then sort of what the milestone is. And so I can get you uh, electronic copies of, of, the, of the state strategic plan if you're interested. Um, and then also, uh, not just for conservation easements, but for practices. What are we looking to do, and how much of it are we looking to do, where are we looking to do it? So as the years progress, we hope to see these, um, you know, move on and fill up and, and get closer to our targeted goal. So with that, I think I'm out of time. So, questions in the back? You just uh, referenced that at four percent conifer coverage, uh, like activity is sharply reduced. How does that carry over to occupied habitat? That's, uh, I'm not a science guy. I'd, I'd have to defer that to someone in our science shop, you know. Um, I'm sure there's folks in the audience who would take a stab at that, but can't. I'll show you some figures this afternoon. They relate exactly to that. Awesome. Last year I talked to the Intermount Joint Point West Venture up in, they had a, a grant program, and uh, on the grant program they specifically said that the <coughs> state grouse is not going to be uh, one of the yeah. That, why, why was that? Sure. So the the grant that you're referring to is the Intermountain West Joint Venture Capacity Grant. Yes. Uh, they are not putting resources towards sage grouse because no, they, they were greater, but not better. I I thought I think in general they're not doing sage grouse because there's so many resources through SGI, um, and that's the idea is that they're trying to kind of keep that money separate for wetland issues and other issues, so they don't want to add. It's a fifteen thousand dollar grant per year, and you know, given a lot of what's out there, they kind of want to see that targeted towards other priorities for the joint venture, like what what that does. In the back. Yeah, this is kind of connected to that question. How much currently from SGI is going toward Gunnison sage grouse conservation, and how much is greater sage grouse? You might have had it. 
Yeah, those last couple slides kind of get into that. Um, unfortunately, the way the um, programs have been tracked at the state level, we were unable to really tease that apart for the 2010 to 2014. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but prior to this talk, we just, I working with my NRCS colleagues at the state office, we just didn't have time to get it figured out. So we could do it, I would say, largely has focused on uh, greater sage grouse, but there has been a significant number of easement dollars from SGI. Maybe John um, or Ed could talk a little bit more to sort of how much of those resources have gone to Gunnison, but, but there has been some. You mentioned several programs, your uh, clearing of conifers and your fence marking programs. Do you follow any of those up with monitoring to see whether they're having the desired effect uh, and make sure that we're spending our dollars in the right places? Yeah, so the grazing prescriptions, all of that requires monitoring. So that's a part of the contract. So when we're in a prescribed grazing program, you know, follow monitoring is a part of that. Um, as far as the fence marking, I know there's some other studies going on. I don't think it's specific, you know, we don't ask a landowner to go out and walk and see if, you know, the fences that are marked versus not marked or, you know, any difference. But I know there's some, some studies from some organizations that are occurring to get to that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And another point I just want to make, too, is that, you know, a lot of these accomplishments that you see through SGI, 50% of those acres and, and goals that we met over that first five, four or five year period, 50% of that was done through sort of our our boots on the ground, our partnership biologists. The other 50% of this is done by full-time NRCS staff. So, you know, it's a partnership effort, but but there's a lot of full-time NRCSers who spend a lot of time thinking about this and implementing these projects. And, and you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't you know, point that out. Do you anticipate having significant resources for these kinds of projects for guns and sage grouse between now and 2018? I, I do think there are, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, they, they'll compete within the state, but there's there are significant resources there. Thanks. Right. So, uh, let's give a big round of applause.